Um, I would like to introduce um, Professor uh, Henry Achen. Um, I would like to first say that uh, we were at the beginning very fortunate uh, to hopefully have the, the, the lecture face to face. So Henry was supposed to be here with us physically, but as we know during these turbulent recent times, uh, we keep experiencing surprises and that's what happened. And I would like to thank Henry for uh, willing to do the lecture uh, in the format that we're all acquainted with uh, online. So first of all, thank you for that. Uh, it's really our pleasure. Um, and before we start the lecture, I will just introduce uh, Henry. So Henry Achen start, uh, studied architecture at Eidelman University of Technology, Faculty of Architecture from 1986 to 1992. He was the first graduate student in the Netherlands to use virtual reality in the presentation of his project. From 1992 to 1997, he did his PhD on knowledge encoding and drawings under the guidance of Thais Bax and Robert Oxman, which we are all very well acquainted with. From 1998 to 2000, he was a postdoc researcher at the newly formed Design Systems Group from where he continued as an assistant professor until 2010. Since 2005, he was assistant professor at the Faculty of Architecture at the Czech Tech, uh, Tech, Technical University in Prague. In 2007, he obtained, uh, he was tenured as an associate professor and in 2018 was appointed professor. Uh, he leads design studios since 2005. He was appointed head of design studio in 2015. And since 1995, he is a member of ICAD, uh, which he served as vice president from 2001 to 2005 and as president from 2005 to 2009. Um, so with this small introduction, uh, I will pass uh, the microphone to Henry. Uh, for a lecture which uh, I expect to be quite remarkable. So thank you, Henry, for joining us, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Shani, for, for this uh, nice introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I suppose that you can see my screen uh, running. Yes, we can see. Excellent. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, hosting this uh, presentation um, uh, online. Uh, as was already said, uh, due to uh, complications with, uh, with COVID, uh, unfortunately, I cannot be present in person, which I would really love to. Um, but we're going to try and uh, make that happen uh, next time. So thank you very much for joining this, uh, this lecture. Um, I will first give a very short uh, background um, about myself, and then I'm going to talk about the, the main topic of, of the research, um, and that is uh, my, my research over the past al already al almost 30 years on uh, examining drawings and making tools for, for drawings. Um, so a little bit about the um, background. Um, so I studied architecture at, uh, at uh, TU Eindhoven in the, in the Netherlands, um, after which I pursued uh, a PhD also at, uh, at the same school. Uh, this was already uh, mentioned. Um, I did my uh, diploma work in the design methods group, which was led by, by uh, Thijs Bax. And Thijs Bax was the person um, who opened for me, you could say, the way to, uh, to science uh, and uh, who convinced me that doing a PhD was, uh, was the right way. And very importantly, um, in the group, we were joined by uh, Robert Oxman. And Robert really was the, the professor who showed me the way, you could say, to international research. He, uh, he introduced me to, to ICAD, uh, to the international conferences. And so both Thijs and Robert were for me very, very important uh, people in the early formation of, of my research um, and uh, still are for me a very big inspiration for, for which I am very, very grateful that, uh, that both of these wonderful people have been 
um, at the beginning of my research um, career. And throughout this presentation, I also want to show a little bit how uh, research depends on, on contacts, ideas, and inspirations by, by other people. It's not something that you do alone. It's always something that happens in a certain uh, research context uh, and working with other people. Um, after my PhD for 10 years, I was assistant professor in, uh, in architecture at the design methods group, design systems group, where in particular, uh, we looked a lot um, at the design methodological background, how virtual reality can be used in the design process. And uh, since 2005, I was first partially assistant professor at the Czech Technical University in Prague. Mm -hmm. And after that, um, from 2007, uh, full time. Um, so I became a professor in, um, uh, in Prague, where I had the, uh, the privilege to, to start a new uh, research group. Uh, and also in, in that research group, among many other things that, that we uh, investigate, we are still looking at um, drawings as, as one of the um, research topics in, uh, in our group. Okay. Um, of course, there are many reasons why uh, to study uh, drawings. The, um, drawings are a very rich uh, field to, uh, to look at. Uh, you can look at it, for example, from, a, from an artistic perspective. Uh, you can look at drawings from the viewpoint of style, how things are represented in, in many different ways. You can look at the history of drawings, how technologies developed. Uh, how ways of representation developed throughout time. You can also look at uh, the meaning of drawings. Uh, for example, this uh, rather, I would say, uh, non-remarkable image, of course, became world famous when it was sold um, at an auction. And then the picture that was embedded in the frame suddenly became uh, shredded um, after the moment that this uh, image was sold. Strangely enough, uh, after this picture was basically destroyed, it was sold for 16 times the value uh, for which it was bought uh, originally. It's a strange world, uh, the world of art um, business, I would say. And finally, of course, you can look at drawings from an uh, anthropological point of view as something that is really innate uh, human activity and a human um, ability. Now, uh, in my field, of course, I'm an architect, so I look at uh, drawings from the perspective of architectural design. And even there, of course, there are many different viewpoints, many different perspectives that you can look at, uh, at drawings. You can look at the history of drawing, um, how drawings have been uh, developed, uh, even more uh, historically speaking within design processes, how drawings are produced. You can look at drawing as, a, as an artful expression uh, within architecture. For example, the very famous um, etchings by uh, Giovanni Battista Piranesi for his uh, Carcieri um, series. But more contemporary example, for example, the drawings by Labius Woods uh, really indicate also the, the artful quality of drawings and, and why we find them very, very um, um, interesting and compelling. And finally, the, um, the direction that I want to go in is drawings as a tool to create and, uh, and understand designs. Now, if we look at the difference how people, architects, and computers look at, uh, at the drawing, if we want to understand it, then um, it is clear, of course, that, that drawing, making drawings, looking at drawings, appreciating drawings, is something that is innately uh, an ability that every human being has. It comes really natural. Uh, no matter where we are, if we can find something to make markings on a surface, then we basically do that. Um, however, if you want to be an architect and if you are going to draw uh, like an architect, then that already is no longer, you could say, a natural ability. It's something that you have to learn. Um, the ability to understand drawings, to understand sections, to understand plans, uh, perspectives, to create them is something that you really have to learn. You learn that in, in architectural school. So the difference 
between architects and people is on two areas. The first one is a skill, the ability to make drawings. And the second one is domain knowledge, what the drawing actually means. Both of these have to be learned. Now, computers, uh, they don't draw by themselves. They have no skill. There is no innate ability for a computer to, to make a drawing. However, of course, the, the reality is that we are using computers a lot for drawing production, but more as a, as a passive tool. Um, and computers basically have a very hard time to, to understand drawings. They don't have the domain knowledge. And the main reason is, of course, that the, uh, the basic uh, approach, how to tell computers what they should be doing, is language-based. If you program them, also the, the, the information processing that happens in the computer is a linear approach. You can do it uh, in many ways parallel, but at the end of the day, it's, it's more like a language-based uh, approach. And there's nothing in it that is inherently, you could say, two-dimensional or three-dimensional. If you want to do that, then that's something that you have to put in the computer. You have to tell the computer how to do that. So these three fundamental differences are between these, uh, these groups. Now, why um, study drawings? There are uh, many reasons. And for me, the, the most important reason is that if we understand drawings better, how they are made, then we can make tools that help us um, create drawings, tools that help us understand drawings. And if we understand then these drawings, then of course it also means that we have generated knowledge about the very important aspect of, of our domain architecture. Um, there are many different pathways how to go about it. Uh, one of them is, for example, automated uh, drawing recognition, which you see an example over here, which is very often called uh, beautification, where uh, the architect or person draws a particular shape by hand and the computer interprets uh, what kind of shape is, is being meant and substitutes it for, you could say, a perfect shape um, that is very close to the original sketch. The second um, area where, uh, where automating, you could say, uh, drawing is very beneficial is for drawing tools. And uh, one of the very, I would say, revolutionary tools when I saw it the first time was the, the Piranesi uh, sketching system, which not only offered tools for uh, making nice visualizations, but it actually used in a very intelligent way also three-dimensional information of the 3D model that was underlying the image. It not only generated, you could say, the, the line drawing of the perspective drawing, but it also generated the, the Z-depth map, which means that the information of the distance in the drawing is also present. So you could take a picture of a tree, insert it in your picture, and as you move the tree along the perspective lines, it would automatically uh, become larger and smaller in proportion to the, to the drawing. When I saw that the first time, I was, I was really like blown away that it was a very, very clever and intelligent way how to combine 3D information, um, but still using a 2D environment. And finally, um, if we understand drawings, if we can interpret them and look at the drawing and say, okay, what's, what's in there, then of course it will help immensely in some kind of uh, intelligent archival of drawings. There is, of course, a huge amount of drawings um, available that are stored somehow. Um, and to make, um, you could say, effective use of, of all this history, all this knowledge that is in the drawings, um, we need to understand them. It's, it's not enough to have just have a scan um, and then store it on the, on the cloud in, in some way. We need some way to intelligently tag, identify, and, and describe these drawings. So that's another pathway why um, a better understanding of drawings would be very beneficial. Now, drawing, of course, as I already said, it's, it's a very important part of the, the skill set of architects. Um, it forms a very important form of communication between the architect and the client, for example, but also within the design team, uh, between the architect and, and other experts, um, and so on. So, drawing, of course, has always been a very important part of the education of architects. And for example, 
things like figure drawing that we see over here is more and more uh, disappearing in the in the regular curriculum of uh, of schools when i was a student um, in uh, in eindhoven it uh, it already disappeared completely if, if we wanted to to do a figure drawing we had to organize it ourselves uh, and i see this pressure increasingly um, around the, the various schools in the world where uh, this kind of drawing lessons are uh, more and more um, disappearing, which I think is a, is a pity. Um, because when you draw, it, it really um, forces you or allows you, if, if you want to look at it in a more positive way, to really observe what you are looking at and trying to uh, then transfer that what you are looking at to, to paper and represent it in the proper proportions with the right textures, the right materials, and so on. So drawing as an observation and documentation tool have, of course, been around like uh, forever. Here is a very nice example from, uh, from the Dutch architect Berlage when he traveled to Indonesia. He had, of course, uh, uh, lots of sketchbooks with him. And these are the drawings that he made during his trip uh, to document the, the things that he saw and which he found um, interesting. And of course, uh, it can be more, you could say, objective. You can use drawings also as measured drawings um, to really uh, do field work and uh, document uh, things. Today, of course, we just take our smartphone and we take a picture and, uh, and proceed. And finally, of course, drawing is also an, uh, an artistic act. It's, uh, it's an artistic act in the sense that you want to make a beautiful drawing with which you um, convince the client that, that what you have designed really is a, is a masterpiece and, and they should pay you for that. But also as an inherent um, uh, skill and you could say the joy and pride of, of making a beautiful representation of your design is something that is, uh, I think, an important part of, uh, uh, of the architectural um, competency. And in a sense, um, uh, also a very um, convincing part, part of architecture. This is the very well-known drawing by, by uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe for the Friedrichstraße skyscraper project, which he made in 1921. And probably you have seen this picture uh, tens of times before in books. It's a very well-known picture. Um, but what is really important to realize is that this picture is one meter 70 high. Yeah, it's, it's as high as a, as a grown up person. So imagine that in 1921, when the, the thing of a skyscraper did not exist, and people saw this picture, which was as big as they are, and uh, for the first time in their lives, they could see something like a skyscraper. You could say it's, it's like virtual reality. For the first time, they saw this enormous vision of a design uh, of a thing that did not exist up till that time. So the role of that drawing was very, very important, very, very impactful um, for that time. So the, the size there really is important and, uh, and matters. Um, so to focus a little bit more towards the, the research that, uh, that, I was, uh, that I was doing, then of course, there are many kinds of drawings that, uh, that you can look at. Uh, you have, of course, the technical drawings that we know as the standard things that you produce as an architect. You can also have hand drawings, which are, you could say, the more free form uh, drawings, but still with, with an intention to precisely document a certain uh, idea. For example, here, a particular way how to uh, create a facade. You can also have sketches, which are much more faster uh, to produce, much more intuitive, you could say. Uh, also less precise, of course. And also a very important distinction has to be made between uh, line drawings, where you just have the, the markings that you make with, with one medium on the, on the paper um, with versus colored drawings, where you can actually add a lot of information in terms of texture and color and material in the drawing itself. And as architects, we have, of course, a quite wide um, variety of representation techniques, how we can show that which exists only in our mind or that that we can observe in reality we can draw perspectives we can draw we can draw plans uh, sections of the building details 
all of these various representations have different purposes. And it's important to, to choose one of them um, if you want to focus in a particular research area. So the focus that, uh, that I show, that I have uh, chosen or that we chose in our research was to look at plan-based schematic line drawings that are produced to be clear. And here is a very good example of what I mean with, with this kind of drawing. This is from a very important publication by Jean uh, Durand. Uh, it was published in 1804, it was called Précis de la Sonde d'Architecture. And it's a series of um, uh, schemas in which he shows in a very graphic way how to design a particular building type. And it goes from a very simple uh, schematic arrangement of an axial system towards the introduction of a grid, um, adding a zoning system for the, for the columns, the structural elements, and step by step in a very graphic way, he demonstrates uh, very clearly how the design process could be done in, uh, in this fashion. And it, this was actually the first book in architecture where this kind of process in, in this way was, was documented. So a very important step in the history, you could say, of architectural drawing. So when I say plan-based schematic line drawings that are produced to be clear, why plan-based? Because the plan is, is a very important carrier of information. It organizes the layout of spaces, it distributes the elements, it, it governs the proportions of the design. And um, I wanted to limit it to, to simple drawings, so not the very detailed final drawings and shop drawings that you have of a completely finished design, which has to go to the, to the production site. But I also did not want to, uh, to look at sketches because sketches by themselves are too ambiguous, too imprecise um, to really um, analyze in a, in a good way. So more or less that what we see here as a, as a diagrammatic uh, representation of architecture. So that was the, the, you could say the complexity level that I wanted to investigate. Now, at the time, uh, my motivation was also to, to look at it from a computational point of view for two reasons. One reason was that if we um, can explain it, let's, let's say it, if we can explain it to the computer, then we, then we can build tools that are useful for the architect. And the second one is more, you could say scientific, that uh, you can only explain it to the computer if you understand it. So by trying to make something um, computational, it gave us the way to um, scientifically look at drawings through a medium that at the end of the day, then, then would also produce a useful tool. Now, at that time, when I started, uh, there was really very exciting research going on um, by Mark Gross. And one of the things that he uh, produced at that time was a system called CoDraw, where um, not only you could draw very simple um, constellations of, uh, of spaces and shapes, but at the same time, you could encode the relations between these shapes. You could say that two spaces have to be um, next to each other, they have to be perpendicular, or there is an, uh, an axis of symmetry, and so on and so on. And that was really very exciting work to, to look at. Um, and it was actually very clear that, that through this um, drawing environment, the architects were encoding a lot of knowledge in the, in the drawing when they, made, when they make them. And I said, yeah, but let's turn it around. If that is true, then my key hypothesis was, okay, then we can turn this uh, direction around. We can look at the drawing, and then by looking at the drawing, we should be able to extract the knowledge that was put into the drawing. So that became my key hypothesis. So this then uh, transforms to the, to the task at hand that, that we were trying to solve. So what are the defining features? in order to understand a given drawing. And a very important condition was that we did not know the history, how the drawing was made. We just get the drawing and we have to try to understand it. But we cannot see, for example, the process, the steps by which the drawing was made, which can give, of course, very important clues about the intention, what the architect had when he or she was drawing it. So if I go through the steps, for example, in this order, 
then it's more likely that the architect was thinking about putting two squares next to each other rather than drawing a rectangle which is subdivided into two parts. Or in another sequence of uh, lines that you can make, for example, like this, then it makes much more sense to assume that the architect is trying to draw a grid rather than that he's trying to draw um, a square which is subdivided into 20 parts. Yeah, but we don't have this privilege to know the history, how the drawing was made. So that means that at the lowest level of the drawing, we have just pixels and lines, but they do not really tell us a whole lot. They, they just say, okay, here are the lines, here are the markings on the, on the paper. On the highest level, of course, we have the complete drawing, but there we have the challenge that we want to understand the drawing. So what we need to find is a mid-level between this lowest level of pixels and lines and this highest level of the whole drawing of elements that help us interpret what the drawing is about. So that is what my research came about. And this led to um, uh, an observation and a hypothesis, and namely that uh, any given drawing is built up of multiple smaller entities, but they are more complex than just simple lines. And that each of these entities have a particular meaning for the architect. And such an entity we call a graphic unit. So then what I had to do in my research was to demonstrate that these graphic units actually can be identified. And what we wanted to do was to identify them from architectural drawings from a very wide range of historical sources. So not just from, let's say, the last 20, 30 years, but as, as old as possible, you could say. And why was that? Um, to give an historical basis to the theory, to just say that it's uh, what we are looking at is, is not a contemporary thing, but it's really something that's very, very basic to architectural knowledge and architectural design. So what we did um, was we looked at many, many historical sources of, of architectural drawings. Here you see a list and see if we could identify many different kinds of, um, of drawings as they are documented in, in these sources. And here's one of the oldest um, that I found. Of course, the, the oldest source on architectural theory is uh, Vitruvius, but Vitruvius doesn't have drawings um, in, his, uh, in his book. But what is important is that he mentions that if you want to be a good architect, you also have to be a good draftsman. Yeah, so there already the link, the importance of drawing is already recognized, but we don't see any drawings um, from that source. So one of the, the, the earliest that I found was from the 13th century uh, by Villard de Honnecourt, which was the sketchbook for, uh, for the profession of, of architect. And as we go on um, in time, I just want to show a few snapshots in, in time of different examples of what kind of drawings we can find if we go through um, this literature, um, historically speaking, um, and, and see a very wealthy, you could say, catalog almost to, to speak of many different ways how architecture has been represented uh, throughout the ages. And of course, as, uh, as we are nearing uh, more the 20th century, uh, there actually was an explosion, you could say, in uh, representation forms, uh, how architecture could be uh, represented. Now, based on this uh, historical analysis of, uh, of all these sources, um, came, came up then with uh, 26 defined uh, graphic units. Here you see a complete overview of, uh, of all of them, where each of these is a particular way how to represent something. So it has particular well-defined set of graphic elements together with an associated meaning for uh, the architect. So um, we could demonstrate from the, from the sources and the analysis that these graphic units really are associated with the knowledge that they encode, and that you can very precisely define the, the graphic elements that, uh, that are there, and that uh, there are drawings that are made up of these um, graphic units. Um, 
if a drawing would have multiple of these uh, graphic units, then we would call these drawings generic representations. And again, based on the historical survey that we did, we found 50 distinct combinations of these graphic units that would form these generic representations. Uh, and it would go from combinations of one, two, three, or four different combined uh, graphic units. So here you see example of generic representations that have just one graphic unit. So you could say the most simple representations of that can be used in architecture, like for example, the schematic subdivision. Um, if you have two graphic units, then it, it becomes already a little bit more complex, like for example, the schematic subdivision in a contour. If you have three graphic units, then the number of elements um, increase yet again. So for example, here, the structural element vocabulary, which are these um, column indications in the contour, which is this cross shape of the, of the church in the modular field that um, organizes where um, the columns can be placed in the, in the plan section. And finally, the most complex generic representations that use four graphic units. For example, this, this one over here with an element vocabulary uh, and function symbols. So the element vocabulary are the, um, the room indicators that you have in, the, uh, in this plan with the function symbols, dining room, kitchen, uh, toilet, living room, placed in a grid. And uh, the grid is then the holder for the overall space, which is the, the rectangle that you see that is the boundary of, of the space. Um, when we had this, uh, this theory of graphic units and generic representations, and we could link the knowledge that was associated uh, with the graphic units um, and the, the things that the architect would, would encode when they are making a drawing like that, then we said, okay, can we now demonstrate this by, um, by creating a design process that is um, completely based on a sequence of generic representations? Um, and we demonstrated it for, uh, for an office building where we moved from a sequence of predefined uh, generic representations going from the most simple to the most complex, increasing the amount of graphic units that were present in the, um, in the representation. As you can see it here from the top left, where we have the, the most simple contour to the bottom right, where the contour is completely um, populated, you could say, with a zoning system with uh, element vocabularies of the spatial elements in the, in the office building, um, with a structural system, et cetera, et cetera. And what was really nice about this um, demonstration is that it's completely graphic. Um, up until, until that time, a lot of the research, especially the research informed from an artificial intelligence approach, assumed that if you wanted to design uh, a building of a particular type, that you needed to define an abstract type of which then that particular building was an instance. Very often it was uh, done through a so-called frame approach where the, the building type representation is simply a list of, of many parameters um, of that building. And you fill in all the possible um, values for the parameter of that frame. And in that way you can instantiate an example. And what we did, um, was, you could say, more an approach that is much um, closer to how the architect works, namely through the developed um, designing of a series of drawings, which was quite different approach than, you could say, the, the, the standard approach up, up until that time. So in my humble uh, contribution to, to science, I would say that this, this is my contribution where, uh, where I showed that a series of well-structured drawings can also generate an instance of, of a building type. And you don't really need that, that very abstract idea of, of an abstract predefined type as was um, mainly presupposed in, in AI research at, at that time. So some implications from, uh, from this research uh, were that indeed there exist well-defined ways of drawing elements that really have established knowledge with them uh, for, for the architects and that they are uh, much more complex. They function on a higher level 
than just a collection of primitives, which I think is a very important um, direction or very important realization if you want to do any um, intelligent system that has to um, assist the architect when, when he or she is making drawings. It's not enough uh, to make tools on the, on the line level. You have to go up higher and add knowledge. Um, and I think the, the elegant solution uh, and maybe also the debatable solution that we found um, was the connection between the graphic unit as a very well set of described graphic elements, which are, you could say, more or less objective, with the level of interpretation. And you can say, okay, I, I object. The level of interpretation is subjective. It, it can never be um, derived you know, as a matter of fact only from the analysis of the drawing. And yes, that's true. Um, I acknowledge that, but I think that is also what um, any representation is about. It has um, a signifier, which is the, you could say the objective part of the representation, but it always has an interpretation part. And this interpretation part is, is part of the discourse of the profession in which you are working. And it has, I think, as a very elegant consequence that it's very easy to switch interpretations, which then again allows for ambiguity, which we, we very often are searching for as architects when we are designing and uh, sketching. And that's something that we as architects uh, do are very capable of doing. When we look at the drawing, we basically are able to switch interpretations, even though in fact we are looking at the same drawing. Uh, and therefore we can generate new ideas, uh, get uh, different orientations, where to look at in the design process, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say that the graphic unit in that sense enables also this kind of ambiguity when you want to look at drawings. So uh, when we did that, of course, uh, we could do also many, many other things. Uh, when I was still in Eindhoven, I uh, had the chance to work together with the computer graphics department. And there uh, I worked together with PhD student Slava Pranovic, who then turned the, the theoretical work that I did into a design tool, which was based on, uh, on the graphic units. So he cre created a very nice tool um, that actually demonstrated the, you could say the day-to-day -day use of these graphic units as a, as a sketching tool for, for architects. And later on, when, uh, when I moved to Prague, uh, I continued with my, with my interest in drawings. And here is a PhD project um, that we did in collaboration with uh, ETH in uh, Zurich. This is a project by Katarzyna Novakova, um, where she developed um, a collaborative sketching tool where multiple people can work at the same time um, on, on a sketch. And uh, I think what was really remarkable about the tool that, uh, that she developed was that it, was that it runs on multiple platforms. So it was not just uh, PC based, but you could access the same drawing uh, from a smartphone, from, a, from an Android uh, platform, from a tablet, uh, from a computer, from a PC, from a Mac, uh, and it was all, uh, all working. Of course, now, nowadays, we find it more or, so, more, more or less um, uh, logical that this is possible, but in, uh, in the time when she was doing this PhD, it, it was not uh, that um, uh, logical that, that could be done. Um, so we demonstrated through many, many different uh, uh, user platforms how the tool would work. So we worked with architects, we worked with architect students, we worked with industrial uh, designers, we worked with lay people uh, to test out the system and, and how they uh, appreciated the, the easiness, how to communicate uh, these drawings. And one of the last um, uh, research projects that we are engaging in is, is by Dario Borzurilla. Um, and he's really taking advantage of the fact that all these digital drawing tools have um, have gone through an enormous evolution and they have become very, very sophisticated uh, tools uh, to sketch and to exchange um, ideas. But still, if we look at the architectural profession, then this digital sketching is, is not that um, widespread. 
Uh, and Dalibor is really looking in his uh, research um, how these tools can have a potential to enrich or change the communication process between the architect and the, and the client. So right now we have come up with a theoretical framework in, in which we can uh, describe not only traditional sketching tools, but also these electronic uh, sketching tools. And the next step that we are going uh, to look at now is to try to find out which of these many, many potential features are the most interesting for, for architects. Uh, and there, of course, you run into a methodological problem that uh, you can, of course, uh, put out an inquiry and ask architects, would you like this feature? Or would you like that feature? Or, or would you like that feature? Uh, and in most of the cases, they will say, yeah, sure, why not? It looks nice. But that, of course, doesn't really give you a very good understanding um, which features would be preferred most over other features. So for that, we are going to use a technique which is called conjoint analysis, um, which is a very clever technique in, in which you make um, hypothetical combinations of certain parameter combinations. Uh, and you offer these sets of combinations to a large group of uh, respondents. And because of the particular mix of parameters, um, when you get then the feedback from, uh, from the architects, okay, do you prefer um, a tool that has these options over this tool that has another set of options, then by getting enough of this feedback uh, back, you can actually calculate the innate um, preference of architects for uh, certain features. So that's the next step that we are going to engage in in this uh, research project. Now, um, before I'm going to show what, what other people did on um, uh, architectural drawing, supported architectural drawing research, um, this is an area that has seen research for over uh, 40, 50 years. And uh, progress is still quite slow, I would say. Um, if you go, if you buy any, any uh, contemporary CAD system, then um, it, is, uh, it becomes clear immediately that it still doesn't allow you to draw in the natural way as, uh, as you would as an architect. So why is that? I mean, there, there are plenty of reasons um, why this should be a good application for, for architects. And I think uh, the reason is very simple and uh, you just have to find where is the money. Um, it is not really known how many architects there are on the, on the world, but a good estimate is that there are about three to four million architects in the world. Yeah, so that's the market that, that we are talking about. Now, if you compare that with um, Instagram, there are one over one billion Instagram users in the world. So that's 2,250 times the number of architects. And what do Instagram users do? they put pictures of their favorite pet on Instagram or fashion or food or whatnot um, on Instagram. If you look at YouTube, there are even more YouTube users. There are 2 billion YouTube users on the world. That's 4,500 times the number of architects. So where does the money go? The money goes into automated image recognition on Instagram and automated video recognition on YouTube, but it certainly does not go into drawing recognition. The market is simply too small. Yeah, so for still for all these decades and many, many intelligent, uh, highly motivated uh, people have invested a lot of research, a lot of creativity, a lot of intelligence into this problem, but it has always remained an academic uh, research problem. It was never picked up, you could say, by the, the industry at large. Having said that, of course, many things um, have happened in the, uh, in the past and many interesting um, research directions have been pursued. Um, in the area of automated drawing processing, one of the most uh, fruitful areas that we can look at for inspiration is handwriting recognition. 
which has already become very, very advanced. Um, and most of the automated handwriting recognition systems do a pretty good job in interpreting any given um, handwriting in any given language. Of course, uh, for us as architects, um, it only goes so far. Uh, handwriting recognition gives us a very good basis to understand um, the strokes that we make in a drawing, but it doesn't help us understand the drawing as a whole because the drawing as a whole is a 2D organized on a plane and handwriting recognition is always a linear affair of smaller elements. But nevertheless, it's, it's a very fruitful direction which, which can give us the, a lot of building stones, you could say, to build up on a higher level um, recognition in, uh, in drawings. So the recognition is, is one part of, of major research. And the second part of major research is, okay, if, if we can understand what these drawings are about, then we can make more intelligent uh, drawing tools. And the one that you see here at, uh, at the top is one of the pioneering uh, examples, again, by, by Mark Gross. It's called the electronic cocktail napkin, uh, where you could really hand sketch uh, diagrams uh, and then the system would automatically recognize that you are drawing spaces, that you are having adjacencies between these spaces. It would build the representational graph underlying that and help you reason about the design. And the image that you see uh, below is, I would say, the, the most advanced uh, version to date. Um, it's called Esquisse, which was developed by uh, Pierre Leclerc in Louvain with his research team where you can actually start uh, sketching a floor plan with spaces and stairs and uh, columns and whatnot. And the system would recognize all these elements and, uh, and interactively can generate on the fly the three-dimensional model that is associated uh, with that sketch. Um, and these, I think, are, are very interesting, very advanced uh, systems that can really show um, the benefit that you have once you can um, reliably interpret um, drawings and sketches. Now, all of these approaches, you could say, stick to the main paradigm that sketching and drawing is something that happens on a 2D plane. Um, and of course, we are now in an evolution in um, design support with computer tools where we are moving increasingly, of course, into the third dimension and maybe even the, the fourth dimension. And um, so sketching in that sense is, is lagging behind. It's, it's, um, it's not connecting to uh, the complexity of the world as we are trying to uh, tackle it right now with, with the most advanced modeling tools like parametric modeling, generative design, um, et cetera, et cetera. However, there is one example, which I think is today the most uh, innovative sketching system that, that exists in the world. Maybe you have seen it before. It's called the, the Hive 3D. It was developed by uh, Thomas Dorta from the University of Montreal. What you see here is a, a VR embedded system. Uh, you can see the VR projection on the curved um, canvas that you have in front of you on the top side of this picture. And so it's a three-dimensional representation of a, of a design. You can import uh, point clouds of a, of a scan of a situation. And then inside of that 3D environment, you can start to sketch and model. And how do you sketch and model? That's what you see in the picture below. You simply take uh, an iPad, so the iPad is your uh, sketching paradigm, what I mentioned just now, the two-dimensional markings on, on a plane. But it has the benefit that the orientation of the plane of the iPad as you hold it in your hands is matched with the three-dimensional model that you have in your VR environment. So here, Thomas Dorta has really been um, capable of merging the advantages of, of all the abilities that we have as architects on sketching in 2D, but doing it immediately in a 3D environment. And of course, uh, if you break through this, this, you could say this mental wall 
how sketching can, can operate, then of course the, the possibilities are, are endless. And I would say this, this is like the, the beginning of a completely new era of uh, sketching research that, that we can actually go, go into. So what I tried to show in, the, in this lecture was uh, an overview of my research on, on drawings in architecture. Um, I tried to demonstrate how it was informed from the perspective of, uh, of design computing uh, and how to turn it into something that can be something like design support. I hope to have shown a little bit of the, of the research methodology, uh, how you have to focus and focus and focus uh, and come up with, with the definitions that can then help you in your, in your research process. And I hope also to have shown uh, how important it is that that research is not uh, a lone act. It always comes in a certain context. You are looking at your peers, the, the, the research that they are doing, the inspirations that they have. Um, and that is really a, a very valuable journey that you are undertaking with, with many other people uh, throughout, um, yeah, throughout your life. So with that, um, I would first of all like to thank uh, Yasha. Thank you for, for having me here for, for, this, uh, for this lecture. And of course, Shani uh, for making this, uh, this all happen and uh, starting the, the ball rolling for this presentation. And uh, Marina for, for setting all this up and being very, very patient with me uh, to, to make this uh, happen. And of course, thank you very much uh, to you, the audience. So I will stop sharing. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. Thank you so much. Um, we would like uh, to maybe start a discussion uh, with some questions. So uh, if somebody, by a raise of hand, uh, if somebody has questions to ask, Otherwise, I will be happy to um, to start. I, I see Davide, but I, I guess Shani, you you will be moderating. Yes. So here, so so Davide, yes, please uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much for the for the presentation. I have uh, lots of thoughts are running in my head based on, on the on the on the presentation. I don't have really a question. I have more of a general maybe reflection, and I would like to to hear your opinion. So. It seems that that uh, the sketch from uh, in the beginning it was a way to, for maybe for internal communication for architects so they could reason about the design and even communicate with with other people the external communication. At the same time, in the latest project that you've shown, it seems that it becomes an interface for the computer to understand what we try to do and then uh, act upon it. Uh, and by acting, it could be uh, understand what the design is doing, but I could think about other, uh, other applications such that uh, generate, like using generative design, general possible permutation of the design based on the partial information that is in the sketch, because the computer somehow needs to complement the level of abstraction. So it needs to fill up some information and then create a lot of possibilities. So I was thinking if, if you also think about this uh, trans transition between sketching as a tool per se, into sketching as an interface and, and, and where it could go, for example, beyond maybe the synthesis of buildings, but mostly also to the evaluation of buildings. So one could sketch the, the, the movement of people like as a, kind of a, as a kind of a line and there would be a simulator that populates the sketch with people. So uh, the sky's the limit, but I was wondering what are your thoughts on the, on the evolution of what is the trajectory of, of sketching in the future? Well, thank you, I, I, I completely agree. Um... Usually I have to convince people that this is direct, the direction where we have to go, uh, but you are already convinced, so I'm really happy about that. <laughs> um, the, the sketch as, as the, you could say, the traditional um, kit uh, and, and skill set of, of architects goes a certain way. Yeah, you, you can represent your, your ideas and, uh, and your thoughts, um, but it, it, it stops at a certain end. And indeed, uh, the moment the computer can um, jump into the, the process as a partner, it can take it further, the thinking. It can start to do simulations. It can start to do evaluation. It can start to ask you, uh, are you thinking about this? Are you thinking about that? It can offer you uh, associations uh, when it says, yeah, maybe you are 
running into that direction? Or have you thought about this building, which is very similar? All of these things suddenly become uh, possible. And for that process, uh, we don't have a language yet. Um, it is, as you say, uh, if I start to sketch uh, people movements, um, then that representation, how I would sketch it, we, we don't have it yet. Yeah, so I would probably start to draw wiggly lines uh, and because of the direction and maybe the speed, how I would draw it, the, the computer could infer some intention that, ah, okay, now he's not drawing a wall, but he's drawing people movement. Um, and that's an assumption. Uh, maybe we need a different brush. Maybe we need a different kind of pencil, or maybe it's, it could just be a hand gesture over the, the screen. Yeah, we, we don't really have that um, sophisticated set of tools yet that we do have for everything else. So um, yes, we have to go into, into that direction. I'm 100% I'm sure of that. Um, but it means we also have to develop the tools then for that and the representations that, that go along. Thank you, Henry, for that, for that answer. I would also like to uh, maybe ask about this business model that you were showing in terms of where the money is. I find that actually really interesting. And my question is, so the other platforms that you were discussing, these type of automation uh, tools, they unify many disciplines together in order to gain the caliber of audience that you're discussing in Billion. Whereas when you're talking about uh, your research, you're uh, creating an exclusive model for architects. And the question is, why? I mean, why can we not be inclusive? I mean, why not develop automation tools that are inclusive for disciplines that maybe have similarities to the way that we uh, work? And in general, I mean, would that be a potential trajectory? Or what are the challenges that you foresee to actually unify this with other disciplines in order to gain a bigger market? Yeah, it's a very good question of, of course, um, the, um, uh, the language, the skill set of, uh, of sketching, how architects have been using it up to date, has always been uh, exclusive for the group of architects. Uh, simply because there was not really a reason why to um, extend that discourse by means of the sketch to, to other partners in the design process. For that, you had the sections, the plan drawings, the shop drawings, uh, where you would discuss with the experts yeah, on, the, on the structural calculation, on the installations, um, et cetera, et cetera. And for, for the engineer, it simply would not make sense to have a look at the sketch because they, they would not um, understand it to such an extent that they could actually contribute their expertise at that point in the process. Unless, except, of course, you were one of these exceptional engineers like, like Arab or uh, people from, um, um, now I'm running out of names, but any of the advanced um, uh, engineering offices where you do have uh, people like Cecil Belmont, who also have a very creative component in their thinking, and they can go along with you in the, in the sketch process. But they are just a few. Now, you are completely right that uh, with these new tools, the potential um, becomes much higher that their expertise can actually be used in a much earlier phase in the, in the process where it still resembles the sketching and ideation of the architect. And I think that that's a very important um, potential, something that we have to uh, investigate uh, because the demands that we have on our built environment uh, with, with increasing demands for sustainability, we cannot wait until the end of the design process, then call in everyone else and say, help us to make this a sustainable building. It's something that has to be done uh, right up front with, with as many people as possible. Um, with at the same time, allowing the, the flexibility and the creativity of the process, um, and you could say the, the holistic ability of the architect to come up with an idea that cannot yet be completely critically um, evaluated, 
but for which you can develop, you could say, the intuition or the conviction that you are moving in the right direction. Um, so it, it's always a very tricky balance to, on the one hand, keep the, the freedom, but on the other hand, uh, to be sure that, that you are moving in a direction that is, that is useful and, uh, and sustainable. Hopefully these tools will help us with that. This is absolutely, um, it's quite inspiring, I have to say. Um, um, I think that uh, maybe I can just thank you again, Henry. I don't know if there are any more questions. Um, but maybe I could just thank you again and hope that we manage to uh, meet <laughs> face to face soon, uh, despite everything that's going on. Uh, and to promise each other that we will find the, the, the way to make this happen. We will surely find it. Of course, feel free to, to share my email address. So if people want to get back to me later on, uh, no, no problem. I'm looking forward to, to your questions, reactions, uh, all, all, also afterwards. And uh, yeah, I'm really tremendously looking forward to do this again in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you very much from uh, Tel Aviv and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much once again for organizing and for being at the lecture. Thank you. <laughs>